Jesus is not struggling. We serve a God who's not in a struggle. You may feel like you're struggling tonight, but he's not struggling. They came to arrest him. He knew the end was near. He knows they're about to take his life, so they think. He says, whom do you seek? He said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he, and they all fall down. He wasn't struggling with the Romans. He wasn't struggling, struggling to see who was going to be in charge. The message this morning, the storm was huge. He's sleeping. He wasn't struggling. Hey, if you're with him today, he's in your boat. He's not worried about your victory. He's already paid the price for it. Brother Luke gave a word to a family this morning that's just like rocked me. We were talking about it at lunch. Micah chapter two, verse 13. I'm gonna read it again in case you weren't here, in case you forgot. Powerful scripture. This is one of those flybys that I've evidently been flying by for 44 years. New King James says, the one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. Amen. The one who breaks out. Some of y'all been here, you're here tonight, but some of y'all been struggling for breakthrough. You, you need to quit struggling for breakthrough. Come on, you're, you are one with the one who breaks through. I don't know if y'all have this in the booth, but I wanna read it in the amplified. The amplified version of verse 13 says, the breaker, the breaker, the Messiah who opens the way. He's the breaker. Come on, I declare tonight is a night of breakthrough. Not because like we decided it was gonna be a night of breakthrough or because you know we, we had our favorite guest speaker here or worship was like really good and it, it just feels like a, a, a night of, of breakthrough. It's because the breaker, the one, the Jesus, our Jesus, the one who breaks through, who breaks out, has gone up before us liberating them and because he has broken out it says they will break out the breaker goes through and then we break out and we pass through the gate come on lift your hands to the Lord and begin to declare Jesus I'm following you through the gate tell him that Thank him tonight that he's the one who opens the doors and goes through the gate. Lord, I thank you that you're the one who goes before us and opens the way. Lord, I thank you that tonight, tonight, this verse is prophesying over our city, over families, over our church, over our community. Lord, I thank you that you're the one that's breaking out and going before us. And Lord, we're following you through the gate. Tell him, Jesus, I'm going with you through the gate. Lord, I thank you for next levels. We declare an end tonight to long-standing struggle. I thank you that we're following you through and we'll never be the same. Come on, lay hold of that tonight. Jesus, I don't wanna leave here the same. We're breaking out, we're following you into a new level of breakthrough in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Now it's gonna be a good night. I'm glad you're here. My kind of people come to church twice in one day. Yeah, that's when you know it's good. It's not a coincidence that Sunday nights have always been like revival time. The people that are willing to return back and say, Lord, I, not enough. Could never get enough, more of you. 
Yeah, tonight's gonna be, tonight is our night. It is the night of nights, amen? It's gonna be good. I don't want you to walk all over the sanctuary, but turn and greet somebody. Tell them you're, how happy you are that they are here and then just have a seat right where you're at and we're gonna get going tonight. Life, the spirit comes alive in you. There's a move of God that you experience like no other. I wanted to become a better Christian. I wanted to be a better servant and follower of what Jesus commanded us to do. We offer an affordable two-year program with a third-year option for those looking to go into vocational ministry. Applying is simple, and it can be done anytime online at ssmen.org. Hey, Amen. What a, what a great day to be in the house of the Lord. What a great day to have Brother Luke with us and enjoyed his message today. And uh, right now we want to turn it to him in just a moment. Before we do, just want to give you an opportunity to bless him. And financially, you know, as a church, we get the opportunity to, if you need an offering envelope, please hold your hand high. The ushers will see that you receive one. And always remember, you can't outgive the Lord. And we have the opportunity and the privilege and and responsibility tonight to take care of our guest and our evangelist and you know when you give it not only gives to him for him being with us today but it you're investing in his and in sowing seeds in the ministry that goes with him wherever he goes week to week to to supply the gospel and what God uses him to do all of our all of our lives we have I've been taught to support missionaries and evangelists, and we believe in the five-fold ministry. And, and Luke, it's just we're great, glad to have you with us today, and it's great to invest in your ministry. And when you go next Sunday to somewhere, I hope your offering's good enough here that you feel like we sent you there. Amen? <laughs> Amen. And uh, how many of you like to be proud that we support our evangelists in a good way? Amen? So um, thank you for giving and thank you for sharing. Uh, your and gen, gener, being generous and giving. Let's pray for Luke tonight as he comes. Pray for the offering to be a blessing to him and Grace and Jimmy, that uh, their daughter, that the Lord would bless their finances and bless the ministry of the uh, uh, of the prophetic through Luke Holter in Jesus' name. Lord, we just give you praise today and honor for your opportunity to give. We come tonight to bring our offerings, Father, for the evangelists. We pray, God, that you would minister to. Luke Holter, we pray that you would minister to his finances, supply every need, and Father, every opportunity that he has to go and to minister, whether it be through uh, the churches or through the prophetic and businesses, Father, that every need shall be supplied exceedingly and abundantly above anything he could ask or think in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you were excited today when he told what the Lord had done to him on Alexis? I'm, I'm blessed by that. I'm blessed by yeah. that. I know what it's like to feel that yes, way, but yeah. listen, God is good. Yes. And if he gave it to you, who can say anything, right? Yes, nobody. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, it's true. If anybody has beef with that, you got to take it up with my Jewish accountant. <laughs> you got to argue with Jesus. Um, I want to do this real quick. I, I forgot to do it this morning, but uh, in the lobby, we have, and most, most of you have already picked these things up, but we just want to make you aware of them. In the lobby, we have a resource table where we've got my book, Filthy Fisherman. Um, this book is uh, titled Fil Filthy Fisherman, How God Uses Weakness for His Glory. And my testimony is in this book. This has been um, a labor of love. And this book was designed to break shame off of people's lives and to give people hope to let people know that you don't have to be perfect, you just have to be obedient. Amen? And so um, God's really breathed on this book, and we've had a lot of salvations, a lot of prodigals. We have uh, 
prisons that are ordering boxes of these for, uh, for prison ministries and all that. So it's, uh, God's really been good with that. And we have the art of hearing the Father. Everything I'm going to talk about this evening requires you to be prophetic. And you need to be taught and you need to sharpen the tool. You need to sharpen the gift that God gave you. You don't need to be taught in order to have the gift, but you need to be taught to know how to utilize the gift. That was a part of church culture until modern times, but people used to train people how to prophesy. And in this book, it's 300 pages of training and equipping on dreams, interpreting dreams, how the Holy Spirit sounds, breaking down if you're hearing from the right source, knowing that when you are saved, your spirit is saved, therefore you can hear from every spirit, not just the Holy Spirit. So it's imperative to know and discern who's talking to you, amen? And so this book um, is to get you educated and trained in what God wants to do, amen? You can do what I do. Okay, I want you to understand that. I'm, I'm not more special than you. I'm not the more gifted person. Like, you can do what I do with the uniqueness of your personality and who you were created to be. Amen? Amen. It means the things that you're into, he can anoint and use them to minister to people. Cool? Um, who would like a book? Who would like uh, this book? I saw a hand back there. Come on, come get it. Yep. I used to throw books until I got sued. <laughs> Just kidding, I never got sued. They never made it that far. <laughs> I have uh, the book on prophecy. Who would like this book? Okay, they're for sale back there in the lobby. Go ahead. Thank you for committing. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. I'm just kidding. Somebody come up and grab this for me. You can come get it right there. Go, go. All right. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get it on like Donkey Kong. How does that sound? Good? Are you all with me tonight? Look, I know you ate lunch. That was hours ago, okay? We got, we got to get into it tonight. We got some heavy-duty stuff to pick up and move around and talk about. Amen? And it's good stuff, okay? For those of you that are nervous because you're like, well, it's 2023. It's going to be crazy. You're right. It is. Um, <laughs> but God's in it. Amen? And so this message tonight is to bring you hope. We've got a large online community that are going to be watching. I was shocked even that little uh, five-minute video I did last night about preparing people to come here. In less than 24 hours, it's already like 3.5 thousand views or whatever. I was like, all right, so people are curious online. Um, we'll see if they're watching tonight. I'm sure the replay will be fun <laughs> for them as well. Okay, bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we thank you for this evening. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your guidance, your direction, your discernment. Father, I pray that everybody in this room, God, that they would embrace the prophetic. Father, that they would embrace hearing from you, that they would understand that they can hear your voice, that they are not uniquely deaf. Father, but that they can hear you, that they are not the one lowly orphan on the outskirts of camp, but Father, they are adopted through your Holy Spirit. They can cry out, Abba, Father. Lord, they were predestined in love. That means predestined for adoption, it says. Lord, that means we were predestined to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Lord, I pray that they would understand that the living God is in them. Father, that heaven and divine communication dwells within their very DNA. It is not something to be reached for. It is something to be reached into. Father, that you're not falling on people, that you're living in people. Father, I pray that tonight would count. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, Amos 3.7 has become a very meaningful verse to me. It's a meaningful verse to anybody that moves in the prophetic, anybody that has been labeled in the office of prophet. Um, and Amos 3.7 says this, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. What does God do? What does it say? Nothing. God doesn't make a move without revealing it first to the prophets. Which means in the body of Christ, we had better be embracing. Now, I'm not talking about celebrity worship. Okay, I'm not talking about being impressed by the size of somebody's platform. But I'm telling you that as the everyday believer, you had better embrace the prophetic voice in your life that God has put before you, whether it's me, whether it's another person, whether it's your neighbor, whether it's your sister, your husband, whoever it is, embrace it because God's moving through them and God's saying, I do nothing without first releasing it, 
without telling people to prepare my bride, to prepare my church for what's to come. God's constantly, constantly trying to make us ready. Can I tell you that the church should never be surprised by the enemy's plans? We should never be caught off guard. That's our biblical heritage that God would drop the blueprints of war into the minds of prophetic people to avoid war, to avoid famine, to avoid disease. We have to start embracing the prophetic. Now listen, maybe you had somebody that was in your life that did it wrong. Maybe they manipulated you. Maybe they abused you. Maybe they tried to trick you or tried to steal something from you or tried to gain your confidence to hurt you. Maybe they were just immature and didn't know what they were doing. Whatever the reason is, you have no excuse to reject the prophetic. It is one of the personhood, one of the aspects of the personhood of Jesus Christ. It's an ascension gift he gave to us. Jesus, our Messiah, said it's better that I go that I give you the Holy Spirit. That's a huge statement. Jesus, our Messiah, the darling of heaven, the prince of heaven that we're waiting for said, it's better that I go. He's up in heaven right now, interceding on your behalf, waiting for God to turn to him and say, go. And he said, it's better that I'm up here interceding for you and give you the Holy Spirit that I were to stay with you right now. People crowd in desperation and depression. God, why can't you just come back right now? And he's looking at you going, hey, I'm living in you. I'm with you. Right now, I am your aid. I am your help. Not enough of us call on the supernatural heritage that God's promised to us. You're in a financial bind. If you got yourself there, repent and ask the Lord to release finances into your life. He'll give you another chance. Do you really think that he's a bad father interested in punishing you? You know, the word tells us that he poured out 100% of his wrath on the cross. How much? So how much wrath is left over for you? Even when you make your own mistakes, there's consequences for your actions, but there's not punishment. He's a good dad, and he wants to communicate with us. He wants to guide you. He wants you to stop dating the same train wrecks. Believe me, he's in. He's like, no, that guy stinks. Break it off. You're only attached to him because you don't know what I think about you. He's a good dad, amen? But he's trying to communicate with the world. We talked about this with the Emmanuel message. Jesus would not have even been born when he was born had there not been a prophetic voice on the earth to declare it. That's how important prophecy is to God. It's his plan. So we had better be listening. Now, some of us got burned, right? Because prophetic words came out. Donald Trump in three days will be back. He will be resurrected back into the White House. <laughs> and he wasn't. And it hurt the prophetic. There's a lot of dynamics. It, what's funny to me is people that don't study the prophetic are very quick to judge the prophetic. People that can't discern whether or not they should look at porn at two in the morning are trying to discern prophecy. That, that's a problem. They're going, yeah, I knew it. They were all wrong. They're all hypocrites and they're all, no. Prophecy is very advanced. Not too advanced to understand, but it's multifaceted. Humans have free will, which means they have the ability to delay you got to start looking at things through an eternal lens instead of a CNN or a Fox News lens. God does things outside of your sphere of understanding. The word tells us, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Amen? I, it's funny, I got contacted by some Christian media news outlets and they were like, hey, Donald Trump lost. Other people told them to call me. Other prophets said, call Luke. He's usually the one that moves in words of knowledge. We can prophesy over regions, we can do those things, but he's typically the one that gets words of knowledge. So my phone blew up with these people that were like, hey, your friends that are more well-known than you said to call you. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And they're like, so what do you have to say about when Donald Trump's coming back into office? And I was like, I don't. 
I said, my actual word is about the church's uh, inappropriate relationship with a political spirit. And they're like, oh, no, thanks. And so interview was over. Now, again, I'm not telling you not to be political. As Christians, we have to have a political stance. We have to vote the Bible. You, I'm not telling you to be silent either, but I'm telling you not to let your politics be your identity. Let your politics follow your identity in Christ Jesus. Well, amen. Some of you will send me hate mail. That's fine. Mostly the people online. Y'all know me. God's trying to get us ready to start listening. And I, I've been, can I be honest? I've been getting frustrated. If I were to tell you what I feel, I'm I'm frustrated. I'm getting, invite, I'm getting invited to all these huge events at these huge arenas and these big conferences. And I'm having dreams of directional things, dreams for entire generations of people. And I get invited to these events to come speak and share these God-given dreams. And I get there and the conference falls into the old wineskin of conferences. where they don't give new people a chance. You can get trumped by more famous people in ministry. And then the message doesn't go out. God is wanting to tip over sacred cows. He wants us to tear down these religious preconceived ideas that we've had that may have worked in the 90s. I was at an event for uh, Gen Z and there were some people that were getting up. This was in Kansas City. There were some people getting up and preaching and they were preaching a purity message backed by anger. Saying, why can't you just live right, Gen Z? Why can't you just stop sleeping around, Gen Z? Like getting mad and yelling at people. And I'm like, anger will never create purity. <laughs> but love will. Love and understanding will beckon people into the right heart posture to learn why we choose the right things. You'll, you'll, never, you'll never be angry enough to make someone pure. You might be angry enough to make somebody white knuckle it and hide it. God's looking for purity and he's looking to break the previous mold that we had to get things done. The church in America, and listen, this is gonna bring me some heat, but I'm just telling you, I don't answer to any of you. I answer to somebody far bigger that I have an, internal, an eternal relationship with that I'm gonna have to answer for in eternity. So yes, I'm accountable to people, yes, to a degree, but I'm just telling you, a lot of the church in America has become incestuous. What I mean by that is, it's the same people getting saved that, or just church hopping. They're going to different conferences, going to this church, then they're going to that church, then they're going to this church, then they're going to that church. The problem is, when you keep using the same stale blood to create a new community, just like in England when they tried to keep the throne, it started distorting their facial features. They got long foreheads and big bottom jaws and started distorting the bride's appearance because they had muddy blood from incest. God's wanting to interject fresh blood into the body of Christ. Freshly saved savages. God's wanting to bring some dread champions into the house of God. Some people that are unwashed, unclean, and worth living in. God is passionate about the lost. We are on the cusp of a major church transformation in America. Some will die and some will live. And I don't mean people, I mean churches. <laughs> For those of you that just got real nervous, they're like, am I one of the ones? Am I one of the 44,000? Some of you got that. <laughs> I'm talking about churches. Some churches will become whitewashed tombs. They'll become thrones with bones on them because they made no room for the next kings and queens. God is raising up a fire in the belly of the bride for evangelism. Listen, before I'm a prophet, I'm an evangelist. That's my mandate from God, and that's your mandate. To find the lost, preach Christ and him crucified, get people saved. Yes, I can use prophetic ministry to do that. But before I'm anything else, I'm a son. And after that, 
I'm an evangelist. And after that, I'm a prophet. And they often work together. One of the major things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in the church again is restore the fear of the Lord. He's passionate about it. Now, when I talk about the fear of the Lord, I had to block somebody on social media. That's just how I am. I don't care about it. I don't know you. You don't sit at my dinner table, so I don't put up with it. I just, you get blocked. If you get stupid on my Facebook page, you get blocked. That's just, I don't mean if you disagree. I mean if you get belligerent. Okay, we can disagree and still love each other. But I put on there the importance of embracing the fear of the Lord, and somebody's like, no, you're wrong. You should never fear God. Fears of the devil. And I'm like, that's not what we're talking about. I don't mean be afraid of God like he's gonna beat you to death. I mean fear is in reverence. God's looking to reestablish reverence in the house of the Lord. Amen. Awe is defined as this, because God, the fear of the Lord means to be in awe. And awe is the perfect balance of dread and wonder. If you only have wonder, you will eventually get lazy about your faith. If you only have dread, it'll break your spirit and you'll hide your sin. But if you have the balance of both dread and wonder, it will keep you even keeled and anchored in God. To understand that he's massive and deserves reverence, but he's also madly in love with you. He wants to restore the fear of the Lord, and the way that the Lord's going to do that is through his goodness, not through, a, not through a strict rod against your back, but it's through his goodness. He's going to start performing, and not that he stopped. We're going to start getting into such alignment that miracles will manifest. We've been the blockage, not him. But we're going to get aligned to such a level that the miraculous will have no choice but to happen. Miracles, signs, and wonders, and healings will be a reflex. It, you won't be able to help it. It'll be a direct reflex of your intimacy with Jesus. You'll be loving Jesus so much and you'll go out and you'll sit next to somebody with an eating disorder and they'll manifest a demon and get healed. God is gonna strike the world and the church with the fear of the Lord that he, you don't play with him. Listen, I've been in meetings where there was people that were famous Christian celebrities. I don't mean actors, I mean ministry celebrities where we've allowed them to be elevated because of what we see, not because of who they are. I've sat in meetings hearing these men and women do and say wicked things. And they had no fear of the Lord. I sat in a man's car. He was planning a revival in um, San Diego. And they said they've had over 700 days of straight revival this started, do you remember they did the big conference at Azusa, Azusa Now, right? Did you guys see that on TV, the big arena, and everybody was there, and they were all participating in it? Well, this guy met with another famous guy and said, hey, I want the next revival to be at my event in San Diego. And the guy said, okay, well, I have an interview with Charisma House today, and if you cut me in and you pay me 80K a month, I'll tell them that the next big revival is gonna be here in San Diego with you and your ministry. And he cut him in on the deal. That guy went, that guy is no longer with us, the one that made the deal with Charisma, he died. But he made this deal, went in, they started lying about testimonies. I didn't know this in the beginning, but they brought me in to speak. And I thought, well, all these other people I know that are well-known go there and speak. I'm sure it's fine. So I didn't even pray about it. I went on relationship. And then I got there, and the devil reared his ugly head. This guy wasn't afraid of me because I'm not famous. I can't harm him or his ministry. If I were to say his name or say his ministry, he could easily go to God TV, any of these, Sid Roth, they'd have him on and he'd blast me. He has no fear of the Lord. I'm sitting there at this meeting. I start getting words of knowledge. And I start prophesying. There's maybe 20 or 30 people in the room, but the way that they fix the camera, they don't move it and they make everybody sit in the same section so it looks like it's full. They tell everybody the room's full. 
It's a little camera trick. There's not always something wrong with that. Sometimes you want to make it look like it's good. It's like taking photos like this. <laughs> right? Where you're like, new year, new me. And we're like, nah, that's a 90 degree angle, fool. That ain't a new you. <laughs> How come when I see you in public, I don't recognize you? <laughs> so they shut it down as soon as I start moving in words of knowledge. He gets up and starts reprophesying my stuff and takes the mic away and then has me sit down. And I'm like, what just happened? And they're like, okay, if anybody here has cancer, stand up and we're going to pray for you. So these five ladies stand up and we're praying for them. They have stage four cancer, stage four terminal cancer. That next night, I go to the meeting and I already feel like the whole thing's weird. I'm supposed to speak. I don't get up to speak. This guy's wife gets up and she's like, hallelujah, we had five people medically confirmed healed of stage four cancer last night. We got the reports today. And I'm sitting there in the front row going, how, how did you get the reports? So the event ends and I, I go to his wife and I said, that, that's amazing. Like, did the, were these people locals? Did they already have pet scans planned? Like, did they already do that this morning? Did they have their pet scans and they got all their medical proof? And she's like, no, I was prophesying. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, we're just declaring that they were healed. I said, no, you said we had medical evidence. She's like, no, I'm just prophesying. I'm speaking it into existence. And whenever they would share these healings, Online, they would bring in a minimum of $50,000 a night. So I'm sitting in the car with this guy, and he goes, oh, hold on, I have a call, and it's, puts it on speakerphone because he's not afraid of me. I can't harm him. I can't hurt his ministry. Puts it on speakerphone. It's a man from the Middle East. He's like, hello, my friend, how are you? And he's like, man, I'm great. And he's like, okay, okay, I got your email so for $80,000, I can promise you that I can give you 40,000 salvations. And I'm sitting there like, am I hearing this right? And he goes, 40,000 Muslims that will wave at the camera that say they received salvation, 40,000 that will pretend that they got filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of them will even be baptized in water for you for that 80,000. I'm shaking in the car with him, fearful, thinking, God, please don't strike this car with lightning while I'm in it. <laughs> please let that be the one seat of mercy here. <laughs> and he goes, no, no, no. You gave my other friend a better deal. You only charged him 50000 for the same amount. And he's like, okay, my friend, you got me. No problem. And he planned this big crusade, raised millions of dollars for this big crusade, went over there, paid all these Muslims $10 a piece and fed them lunch, and they all pretended to get saved. And none of us knew. And we all approved. That's not on us. We didn't know. But I'm telling you, and I'm not telling this to put a sour taste in your mouth. I'm telling you that if there is fraudulent, there is real. There are real salvations. There are real crusades. There are real ministers who care. They're just not always celebrities. Be careful where your money flows. So locally. Yes, you can sow abroad to missions, all that kind of stuff. But this struck fear in my heart that these men do not fear God. They're playing a part. It's become a hustle. The real, the, the real reason they do this is they don't believe that God's real anyways. Why would you conduct yourself in that way? So under Look, I worked for drug dealers for seven years, and I met people with better character than in the church. I'm just telling you, God's looking to reestablish. Look, Gen Z gets it. They can see right through the crap. They can see right through inauthentic things. That's why they're a seed of hope for us. They're not a lost generation. They're a passion generation. They're after one thing, and they don't care about the hype of it. They don't care about how great your ministry spin is. What they care about is seeing the fruit of what you're saying to be true. They're not a lost generation. That's been put on them. God wants to restore the fear of the Lord into the body of Christ. I don't mean being afraid of him. I mean holy reverence. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy 
to receive all of our worship. You are only here because of his goodness. Amen. Every day I wake up and I look in the mirror when I'm getting ready, and not in a shameful way, but I'm reminded about where I came from. I was lost and I was hopeless and I was addicted and I had nothing. But he became my everything. So when I prophesy, yeah, I joke around. But in my heart, I'm sobered. I don't ever dishonor God in that regard. I realize that he is holy. And he wants to instill that holiness that births a whole different kind of breakthrough in worship. We should be comfortable with God because he's our father. But we should not be lackadaisical and lazy with him. We should not take it for granted that we can just boldly keep sinning and lying to him while we conduct our lives in a different way. God's trying to shrink the dot and he's telling us right now, look, and we're gonna get into it. This matters. The reason I'm talking about this, it might seem heavy and it is because people are gonna be separated between the authentic and the inauthentic. God's gonna pull up the skirt and reveal some things about the inauthentic. Our prayer is that we are already going through the winnowing fork and that we are already going through the fire and coming through is pure gold. I'm not telling you to shame yourself or like ridicule yourself, but what I'm telling you is there is a dividing that is coming. And it will be a secular church versus a biblical church. God wants to restore the fear of the Lord by creating awe. And awe is inspired by beauty and excellence. He's gonna do an amazing prophetic movement, an amazing miraculous movement through you. Don't look to us. Listen, God wants you to start looking inward. <laughs> Don't look to me to pray for you and heal you. Don't look to me to come and give you every mystery that God thinks about you. Start internalizing and asking him, speak to me. Because what happens when there comes a day where there's no food, where you're stranded, where you don't know where to find water? Can I just tell you, my phone may not be reachable. You're gonna have to ask the Holy Spirit, hey, Lord, help me. Guide me by your voice. I wish I could call Luke. I wish I could just email him. He can just ask quickly. I get that all the time. Every day, I get about 350 emails a day. And most of them are, can you just ask the Lord what I'm supposed to do? They're like, I could ask, but it just takes so long. <laughs> I'm like, really? You think he's cool with that? You think he wants you to have a one night stand with me when he wants to put a ranga on your fanga? He's a jealous husband. You think I want to insert myself in there? <laughs> no, thanks. I don't want to be in his eyesight for that, in his eye line. We need to start pursuing God, pursuing the Holy Spirit, understanding that you are anointed, that you've been chosen, that you are picked, that you can pray for the sick and they shall recover, that you can pray that people would be delivered from demons and they will. We need everybody to be strategically in their place, believing the truth about who they are in this next season. It's starting. It's not finishing. It's not, oh, this is the word for one year. It's starting now. The whistle's going off. The bells are ringing. And he's saying, now we have to get to a place where we believe what's true about us and what he says about us. We cannot sit here anymore, belly button gazing, going, am I good enough? I don't know if I'm good enough. It's just, Lord, if you could just tell me if I'm good enough. Maybe this next Sunday, I could really feel you during worship and I know I'm good enough. And he's like, Get over it. I love you. I wrote it down. <laughs> but I want to feel it. And he's like, well, read it. And maybe you'll feel it. Quit finding reasons to sideline yourself and start looking for some to get into the game. Who cares if you're not perfect? The Holy Spirit dwells in unpure vessels. Welcome to the family. It's your only hope. Some of you are like, he dwells in impure vessels? Yes, you. <laughs> Me. We try our best and we fail. And he still lives in there. He's not a nervous bird on your shoulder. That's like, ew. You sinned. Gross. 
I'm out of here until you get it right. Do you, you're weird. Do you really think that the Holy Spirit, who is God, is intimidated by your mistake? That he's looking at you going, wow, I really wanted to bless you, but you got a problem, so I'm taking off. Best of luck to you. He's not going to leave you. He's going to help you through it. That's our hope is that he dwells in unclean vessels. That he's the purity that moves in. That cleanses us over time. That we're a work in progress. That even as we're cleansed over time, when God looks at you, he sees the perfect obedience of Jesus. Isn't that a great exchange? Well, hallelujah. I'm giving a word right now. We're going to do this in phases. I have a word for the Church of the United States. So everybody that's viewing, this includes you. This includes Spring First. This includes any church in America that is willing to listen. Any church in America that is willing to participate. This is not an exclusive word for the Assemblies of God. This is not an exclusive word for the Dutch Reform. This is not an exclusive word for Foursquare. This is for anyone who's willing to come into alignment with what God's doing. Listen, we've been a part of Nazarene churches that don't believe in prophecy, that don't believe in speaking in tongues, that are now spirit-filled, prophesying Nazarene churches. We've been in Dutch Reformed churches that don't believe in speaking in tongues or prophecy that are now Dutch Reformed churches filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm just telling you all, Methodist, Catholic, Lutheran churches that have invited us in have gotten the Spirit and come out of old ways of thinking and come into new charismatic ways of thinking. This is the season of Ezekiel 47. This is what we're going to see in the Church of America. And it's for those that are willing to participate. It's not open to every, it's open to everybody, but not everybody's going to participate. Ezekiel 47 is titled Water Flowing from the Temple. Ezekiel 47, verse 1 says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side, going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water and it was ankle deep. Verse four, again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water and it was knee deep. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water and it was waist deep. Verse five, again, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass through for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw the bank of the river, very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Areba and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, and the water of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea. From Engedi to Englaim, it will be a place for the spreading of the nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. I want to stop there. There's strategic people 
and strategic churches that are assigned to this region and assigned to this message. It's open to anybody that's willing to get into it, but I'm going to break Ezekiel down for you. Ezekiel 47. There are people that are doors. There are churches that are doors, and they're either keeping the water in or letting the water out. And in 2023, God is saying, I want to swing open the gates of the churches because the Lord says, I'm going to send a river and it's a river of revival. And when it's a river of revival, I don't just mean a good service with a minor chord and the right speaker. I mean, true revival is salvation. Churches are going to begin, churches that never have done it and churches that have done it are going to join together and begin to open. And the Lord says, in the early part of 2023, it will be water that is ankle deep. There are people that are doors. The water will flow, but not every door will open at the same time. God's plan is to bring about revival in the earth. A revival of salvation, revival of healing, revival of miracles, signs and wonders that will create awe in the world, that the world will literally look at us with disbelief and go, how is this possible? And we're already starting to feel and see the birthing pangs of this now, where I'll be in airports and I'll start praying for atheists at airports that do not believe and I'll start prophesying over them, and God will astound them with the accuracy of his eye. And atheists are turning to me going, how could you know this? And I say, God's watching you. He loves you. He sees your life. He's real. Muslims that say there can only be truth to what you're saying because you could not possibly know this about my life without God revealing it to you. We are seeing hundreds of people over the course of a few months, get saved, come to know Jesus just through encountering them in the world. If you're trying to bring them in to get saved, that's done. We bring people in to get discipled, counseled, fed, to grow in our maturity, to grow in our faith. And yes, we celebrate the times that people get saved in church. But you are assigned to be a fisher of men, to go out to uncomfortable places. The uncomfortable places that may challenge your reputation as a believer. In New Testament survey, they said Jesus, those that didn't know him, Roman culture said he was a, an alcoholic and a wine bibber because he hung out with prostitutes and alcoholics and tax collectors. He wasn't worried about his reputation. Why are you worried about yours? Not every church will open their door at the same time to the river that God's flowing. First, it'll be ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and then swimming. But the Lord says there are churches that will open their doors to what God wants to do. And it's going to bring a camaraderie between churches. As one church says yes and steps into it, it will make it accessible for another church to step into it. Pastor, as you guys say yes and open the door here for a revival, it makes it accessible to everybody in the region who would choose to participate in it. It's an invitation to the wedding. The water will flow, and it says provide many fish, which has to do with salvation. There is going to be a revival of evangelism where we will not be able to help ourselves but to talk about our God, to talk about Jesus, what he saved us from. Some of us have been saved so long that we've lost our thankfulness. But he's gonna remind you of where you came from and what he saved you from. I have to tell people about Jesus. I can't help myself because he saved me. I was destined for hell. I was brokenhearted, destitute, depressed, suicidal. And then he found me. The least I can do is be a voice in the wilderness. And you have the same mandate and the same call that I do to do it. Show up at work. Show up at the grocery store. Show up at the gas station. Be brave. Be bold in your faith. Don't worry about getting rejected. How do you think you're going to handle the Antichrist? We can't even handle people saying no to us. <laughs> like, would you like to know more about Jesus? No, thank you. And we're like in tears for three weeks going through inner healing. 
<laughs> God's like, wow, you're anemic. <laughs> He's like, let's get you built up. Who cares about the no? Keep moving on. There's people that I've called out at events, conferences with thousands of people. And I'm like, the Lord has a word for you. And they say, no, thank you. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, I don't like you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Like, and then we just move on. I don't, I don't drop on the stage. God, why? They didn't let me prophesy over them, Lord. I quit. I quit, Jesus, because that hurt my feelings. What's funny to me is as believers, when we get hurt, why do we always hold him accountable? Other people hurt us and we blame Jesus right away. We're like, well, I quit. I'm not gonna be a good Christian anymore because my feelings were hurt. He's like, that's weird. I love you. Like, <laughs> the water's coming from the temple. And that's the church. And the private lives of leaders are assigned to this movement. God will move based on the private lives of leadership and on the private lives of those who make up the community. So if you want to experience revival, baby, you are personally responsible. Amen. That's a slippery slope. If you want revival to hit this house, it's not just up to leadership. It's up to you. You are personally responsible. How much filth will we allow in our lives? How much compromise? Well, I do this because I feel rejected, so that's why I act out this way. Quit outsourcing your needs to the devil. Start turning to God to meet your needs. Let him meet your needs. He knows what you need. We still have that priest lady idea that we have to go and just be like, oh, I have to pretend and just be your jacked up self. Just go to him. Lord, I suck today. <laughs> like the lady gave me the finger. I tried not to, but I gave it right back. <laughs> Jesus, I'm real sorry. Like He's gonna be like, okay, I love you. It wasn't good to do that. But let's press delete and move on. Instead, we don't pray for anybody for three weeks till it wears off. <laughs> We're like I just, I can't pray for anyone until I feel different. Lord, help you if somebody needs deliverance around you. I'm sorry, it's just I made a mistake yesterday and I can't, I just can't. God's like, get over yourself. You have a heritage of generations of losers that became champions. Hebrews 11, the Hall of Fame was a bunch of losers that failed constantly and terribly and then got up again and became champions. The water's coming. It's gonna be ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and then overtake us. There is a revival coming to the churches in America based off of Ezekiel. <clears throat> based off of Ezekiel 47. I encourage you to read that on your own, read through it, see how you can participate in it, but the Lord is opening up revivals to regions in America that will be diligent with the yes in their heart, that will say yes to it and go, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what it costs me. Well, yeah, but I mean, we got young families. If your service goes too long, I don't care what it costs me. Yeah, but what if you start playing those songs and the people that are really the tithers don't like the drum beat? Church is not supposed to be hostage negotiations. Right? It's not, it's not a jukebox, right? You're not like, it's not a playlist. I don't know you, but for those of you in the room that maybe feel like you don't like the worship music, we're not here to worship you. <laughs> so keep that in mind. You may not like the beat. We may not like the Gaithers. I don't know. It's give and take, amen? There's a place for hymns and there's a place for modern and neither of which, by the way, mean that you're more spiritual than anybody else. Let me just say that. You're like, we only play Bethel, so <laughs> great. Good for you. How's your fruit in your life? <laughs> Even Saul loved worship because it soothed his demons. So. The Church of America has got to get on this page with the Holy Spirit, fearing the Lord with reverence, holding his name above all other names, not belittling Jesus, not 
putting Jesus into this formula that makes him a meme. I've seen so many things downgrading, and I know it comes from a funny place. I know it comes from humor. It comes from comedy, but I'm just telling you, there is something more insidious at work. Some of them are funny. Jesus riding a T-Rex with machine guns. That's funny. But that's not Jesus. Satan moves in subtleties. Which means he's wise in how he strips God's divinity away. We start to look at these things and we laugh and we put up with it on a Family Guy episode. We put up with it on this. We put up with it on that until we no longer take him seriously. He's not a meme. He's not your homeboy. How would you react when Jesus touches down on earth covered in blood, wearing robes of white, splattered in blood, here to make war with his enemies? Hey! <laughs> You look different than I thought. (laughs) He's going to show up covered in blood of his enemies and and he's going to say, you're going to go, whose side are you on? And he's going to say, I'm on mine. Whose side are you on? You got to know him. He's not somebody to be belittled. He's not a meme. He's not a logo. He's not an idea or a vapor. He's a person. He's God. And we need to have reverence again. I'm not talking about dressing fancy. I'm not talking about showing how much you love him by how much you spent on your outfit. That's not righteousness. That's religion. I'm talking about coming with a heart posture that doesn't have holes in it. I don't care if your jeans do. Just show up with a heart posture that doesn't have holes in it. The Holy Spirit gave me a dream on January 3rd That was nuts. And we're going to get to it. This is a dream for 2023. This is something that I believe that we're going to start seeing globally, not just in America, although I believe it will take place in America. But I'm telling you guys this, and, and for some of you it might be boring because it's not like prophetic direction for you personally, except it is. Okay, this is, you all need to participate in this. We all have a strategic part to play, and I encourage you tonight, go home. And ask God, what is my role to play in this? And do not seek the platform first. Don't chase platforms. Don't chase leadership. Chase presence. And once you chase his presence, he'll elevate you where he deems necessary. Chase his presence. Amen? Amen. Your goal shouldn't be, how can I be on a platform during this amazing time that God's doing? It's how can I serve you? How can I be obedient to you on a daily basis to help with what's coming? Because the world is gonna be in disarray. While God's opening up rivers and pouring out in churches, the world is going to be in chaos. And the world is going to be frustrated at the level of peace and provision that's in the house of God. Some of it will spur curiosity and the world will literally come to the church and say, okay, how are you in this city in this economy, making it, but not just making it, but having more than enough. How, how is that possible? Eggs are like $50 an egg. <laughs> They're gonna be like, how, how are you guys surviving? I don't know. I walked outside this morning and there was a basket of eggs on my door. <laughs> now that might sound like pipe dreams to you, but God does those kind of things historically and now. I was with a pastor on the verge of him losing his house, losing everything he had. (laughs) We're sitting on his front porch. He called me over because he was suicidal and depressed. And so I sat on the front porch with him and he's crying. And he's like, I don't know how many, I got, I I need several thousands of dollars just to get my mortgage brought up. We're going to lose the house and all this stuff. He was a pastor that wasn't getting paid. They had like nine AC units on top of their old building and seven of them were broken down. Like they couldn't pay for anything. And we're sitting on that front porch. And I said, well, I believe that God will provide. Let's just pray and see what happens. So we pray. And here comes a golden retriever down the road. Down the road, there's lights going, like sirens going off. Police bust. It was a drug bust down the street in Pasadena. 
And this golden retriever ran, ran down to us. And we're like, oh, hey, boy, what's going on? The dog comes up. We're petting the dog. It's like, <sighs> like starts dry heaving. And I'm like, gross. <laughs> I'm thinking like, how worse could it be? He's going to lose his house. His dog's going to puke on us. Like this, this is a Job moment. <laughs> and the dog starts vomiting up rolls of $100 bills that are rubber banded together. <laughs> covered in peanut butter. <laughs> you got to get it down somehow. So I'm like, uh, <laughs> here's thousands and thousands of dollars in drug money hidden in a dog. <laughs> right? I tried to adopt that dog. That thing's an <laughs> It's an ATM, I guess. <laughs> Not sure where to put the card, but. <laughs> Puked up more than enough money that he needed to get out of debt. Washed it off in the sink, dried it, paid the bank with it. He'll shake the wealth of the wicked into the hands of the righteous. God still does miracles. Just because we've reasoned our way out of it doesn't mean he has. I woke up at 3.33 from a dream. Um, I had a dream with a friend of mine, and um, we were in kind of like a green room area. It was me and him and a bunch of leaders from the body of Christ, and we're in this kind of green room, and I knew that we were in a big football stadium. And um, I don't want to say green room because it was like more like uh, a boardroom where like the club meets and all that stuff and makes plans for the sporting team. And um, we're in there and we're praying. We're going after it. The stadium is full, jam-packed, like 50,000 people. Here's the crazy part about it. It was an evangelistic outreach. And so most of the people that were in there were not saved. There was strategic people and churches that were there partnering that were kind of handling and praying for people and being ready. And it was a big concert that brought everybody into this arena, a secular concert. But it was strategically planned by the Lord. So we're in the green room, and there is a Middle Eastern man that was a atheist news reporter. And he wanted to see what was going on. He was curious. So we let him in. We're in there. We're praying. We're going after it. And he's looking at us with his arms crossed like this. Sneering and looking at us like we're idiots. My friend Ryan is praying in the, in the dream. And I'm standing there by him. I'm next to the reporter that's got an agenda. And all of a sudden, I hear the reporter start going, no, no, this can't be, not me. This cannot happen to me. And I look over at him, and he's shaking and trembling. And I'm watching as his carnal mind does not understand why his body is physically reacting to God's presence. And he's shaking, and he's like, no, no. And he sits down on the sofa, <laughs> and he puts his hands on his head like this, and his head disappears. Exactly my reaction, boo. Exactly my reaction. Everyone in the room screamed, and then it went dead silent because this dude's head just disappeared. You know, how many of you know that's not normal, right? If something like that happens, it's going to get real quick. You're going to be like, uh, mm. And everybody gets quiet, and we're like, uh, and in the dream, the Lord speaks to me and he says, Luke, go touch where his head would be. And I'm like, oh, okay. I don't know if you've ever seen a chicken with its head cut off, how it's running around and still moving. Right. That's why you don't want to touch something missing its head. And so I go, I go over there and right when I touch his hair, his head's still there. It's just invisible. Right when I touch his head, I hear a clap of thunder and lightning shoots down my right arm into his head and his head reappears and a massive legion of agenda-driven demons that were, they were literally carrying funhouse mirrors shot out of his head. And he was instantly delivered from a legion of demons 
that their primary job was to twist and contort the truth. And then he got saved and started crying out to Jesus. Now, this is happening in a boardroom setting while the arena, they don't know what's going on. We have big screens like this, and we're watching what's going on in the arena. And at the exact same time this guy gets delivered, the whole arena jumps up and starts erupting and crying out and worshiping God. And we're like, yes, like we're going for it. We're going. It's, it's as if Jesus himself just touched down in the middle of this football field, and everybody saw him for the first time. They went crazy like that. And all at once, in this whole arena, everybody starts confessing their hidden sins. Everybody, every leader, everybody that you thought was crystal clean, for some reason you thought was squeaky clean and perfect, and they're not, started confessing all their sins, and the Lord did something so beautiful. It was almost like speaking in tongues. Everybody started confessing their sins, but people couldn't understand what people were confessing. And the Lord said, I'm going to protect everybody so nobody can have ammo against anybody else. The Lord said, nobody can hear it and go, did you hear what that leader so-and-so struggled with? Oh, I let him pray for me. Why did I let him pray for me? He's got an issue. They couldn't make out and they had no ammo. They had no mud to sling on anybody because it was covered up in a mystery. But it was pure before the Lord, and people were truly, purely repenting for the sins that they've committed, ones that they were too afraid to ever acknowledge. And at that moment, when people repented and confessed all their sins, Jesus landed. Every major revival led to a presence. I believe the next major global revival that we see will not lead to a presence. I believe it will lead to a person. And in the prophetic circles that I'm running in, we all feel the same way. To tell the church, you'd better get ready. You had better get your house in order and the lesser pleasures that you've put up with to allow yourself a reason you, baby, you better get rid of it. I don't care if you're looking for an excuse why it's okay to have sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend or why it's okay to live together, why it's okay to steal, why it's okay to lie, We're allowing ourselves entitlement issues of sin. God's looking at us saying, listen, I'm giving you mercy. I'm gonna give you a season of repentance to truly cry out and turn from your ways so that I can send revival, so that I can heal your land. God wants to do it, but it's going to require us being grave diggers. We're going to have to dig up some skeletons and we're going to have to throw them out and let God sort it out. Have no fear. I'm just telling you right now, the church that God's wanting to establish in the earth is a church that's safe for people to fail. It's a church that doesn't keep score. It's a church that when you confess your sins, Depending on what the sin, yes, all sins the same in the eyes of God, but in the practical world, certain sins require certain follow through. How many of you know there's a difference between stealing from your neighbor and being a child molester? Equal in the eyes of God, but one of those requires way much more follow through and behavioral observation. God broke out in this dream and I saw it go. I saw seven stars fall out of heaven and I knew that the seven stars were the seven angels assigned to the church and each star was assigned to a particular region of the world and all stars came together to work together for a global revival. And as each star hit the earth, instead of it being a falling star, it was a First Nations or a Native American beaded horse in different colors. And we got one here in Texas. And it was a red horse. That had to do with fiery passion and breakthrough. Red symbolic of breakthrough. And God was handing it to us. And I saw three different levels of stadium, small, medium, and large, and God's gonna fill them all. Yes. Right now in Houston, 
if 40% of Houston got saved, there's not enough buildings in the city to contain the people. Think about the infrastructure. We have mega churches here. It's not enough. It's his mercy that revival has not poured out yet because we don't have an infrastructure. We don't have enough people even believing that it can happen. So when it does, how many underskilled, undereducated people are gonna have to hustle and figure it out quick? God's trying to tell us now, become a riverbed. Be carved out already for when the water comes, for when it hits. Revival's coming to the world, not just the Church of America. We're not first in line for it because we're just prosperous. I woke up from this dream at 3.33 in the morning. I started praying with the Lord about this dream, started writing the dream down. 10 minutes later, now this is what's crazy. I start writing the dream down, right? So there's a line that I wrote in my notes that said, everyone has to play their part. Everybody has to be strategically placed in obedience to play their part. You cannot be out of sync. If you're out of sync, you're gonna be out of link and you're gonna miss it. I'm the type of person that I says, look, you're not gonna miss it. Don't worry so much. I'm telling you right now, as somebody who moves in grace and says, don't worry about it, you're not gonna miss it. Worry about it, you might miss it. I'm telling you right now, be strategically obedient. I don't care what it costs you. It's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it. Get prepped, get ready, not for disaster, but to disciple, to love, to care, to provide. Be open. Be strategically placed. And I said, everyone has to play their part, but I wrote the word wrong. Instead of play, the word was P-A-L-A-Y. And I went to correct it, and the Holy Spirit's like, no, that's not a misspelling. Pay attention to that word. So I corrected it and wrote the word down. It's actually a Filipino Tagalog word that I've never heard. And it means the harvest before the wheat or the rice is shucked. It means the harvest that's in the sack before the winnowing fork has come to it. It has to do with the harvest. And it was a Filipino word in Tagalog. I'm married into a giant Filipino family. I had never heard this word, Pele. Ten minutes after this, after this mistake... I get an email from my friend's sister-in-law and he lives in the Philippines. And she said, hey, he's in the hospital right now for kidney issues. He's in the ER. He may not make it. Please pray now. This is the city he's in. This is the hospital he's in. And the Lord spoke to me and said, where your friend is right now in the hospital, the Lord said, first of all, he's gonna make a recovery. And he did. Thank you, Jesus. He's a kidney patient now, but... He, he lived and wasn't going to. But the Lord said the city that he was in was exactly where I'm gonna send a major revival in the Philippines. There's going to be a stadium in the region of Cebu. For those of you that are watching online that are in the Philippines, revival is coming to the Philippines. There will be a great salvation of young people that will come to know Christ that will not fall for the old religious ways for the old ways of being perfect, looking perfect, acting perfect. But there is going to be new young people in the Philippines that will be obsessed and possessed for a passion for God. They will be absolutely possessed by God to run after the kingdom. And thousands and tens of thousands will come to know Christ in the Philippines. This is what the Lord said. He said, I want to fill stadiums. And the reason the old wine, mod, the old wine skin won't work is because egos filled stadiums. And he goes, if your ego fills a stadium, I can't. So the Lord said, what I'm going to do is raise up fellow workers that are going to come together, unite together without worrying about fame, without worrying about how much time am I going to get on the platform, without worrying about, oh, what Christian celebrity is going to be there to prophesy over me or to pray. For, all that's going to be out the window. And they're going to say, we need to co-labor because revival is here. Our motives are going to change. And they'll be good. I'm not saying we all have bad motives, but I'm just telling you, we are going to get an alignment. The word says, touch a coal to my lips. And I saw that I was a man of unclean lips. 
God's going to touch a cold to your lips, and you're going to realize the ways that you're insufficient, but he's sufficient. Amen. It's going to sober us up and say, oh my gosh, I, I have to pursue this authentic real thing with him. I can't play games anymore. I can't get lost every Sunday or every Saturday then get saved every Sunday. I can't say I'm a fan of Jesus and then smoke weed with all my friends. I can't say that I'm a fan of Jesus and then be surfing porn at two in the morning. I can't do these things and say, because people are gonna need, there's broke people, demonized people that are gonna need the anointing that's on your life. And if there's any mixture in you, the anointing will not break through and we will be eaten alive by the demonic. We need to humble ourselves and play the role God has given to us. When we do, we will see a massive harvest of souls. Pele, like I said, it means to be harvested. God is setting us up for a major harvest. And I believe in Cebu, Mandau City, in the Philippines will be a major spot I want you all to look, pay attention to the news about awakening and rumblings of awakening in the Philippines. Pay attention. There's going to be signs in the earth. We're condemned for not knowing the seasons and the times. I'm telling you, pay attention because the earth is going to start groaning in specific ways to let you know God's knocking at the door of the church saying, look, I'm coming. My bride needs to get ready and participate. My bride needs to get ready and participate. God is trying to make us ready. 2023, this goes along completely with your vision for 2023. The world is gonna be lacking in some things and we're gonna need to step up and show the world just how good our dad is. Just how providing our father is. The word 2023, the number 2023 in the Greek means to lavishly supply. That's a strong concordance for 2023. To lavishly supply. To go above and beyond to give you more than what you need. Why on earth would God give you more than you need? To share it. The gift of hospitality. To smush our lives together and say, oh, you don't have enough for rent? Baby, we got enough for rent. Here you go. You don't have enough for food? Baby, we got all sorts of food. Come on. Like the first century church to smush our lives together. You got to know if you worship God or your 401k. <laughs> the word, tw or the number 2023 in the Hebrew means mountain, or it means Mount Horeb specifically. But it means mountain, and the word mountain in the Hebrew means promotion. And it's specifically talking about Elijah being in a cave. 2023 is Elijah in a cave. There's going to be a wind, a fire, and an earthquake. I'm prophesying. I pray to God you're paying attention to this. There's going to be a fire, a wind, and an earthquake. There's going to be the fire of offense. There's going to be the wind of oppression that will exhaust you. And there's going to be an earthquake that shakes everything you're comfortable with. But the good news is, God's not in any of it. He's in the still, small voice. And if you stay anchored to the still, small voice, just like Elijah did, Elijah was in a cave hiding because he was desperate and he was going to be killed. It was desperate times. And when he heard the still small voice, it says he covered his face just like Moses covered his face when he went to go to the secret place to meet with God. Elijah covered his face and God beckoned him to the mouth of the cave and up the mountain. If you are anchored to the still small voice and you know God's voice, you will not be persuaded by the fire, the earthquake, or the wind. And you will not be destroyed by the fire, the earthquake, or the wind that's coming with the economy and social issues. But I'm just telling you, there is, we are in a fever pit right now. Things have gotten so dark and frustrating and confusing in the world that we saw it right now with this athlete that, that almost died. Where secular people are on the news, CNN, praying for him. And people are not ridiculing them for praying. 
I believe we are on the cusp of something major as a nation where people are going to say, okay, I'm sick of all the darkness. I'm sick of all the confusion. I'm sick of all the identity problem. There's only one answer that's going to get presented. Exactly. Jesus is the answer that's going to get presented. But the Lord's saying, listen, in 2023, if you listen to the still small voice and you're not distracted by all the noise, you're going to get to come up the mountain of promotion into his lavishly supplying for you. That's his promise. Now you can receive it or not, but I'm just telling you, God wants to bless your finances, your business, your family, your kids, your marriage. He wants to upgrade all of it. He wants to lavishly supply. But because of disappointment, we're afraid to expect it. I'm telling you, do not allow disappointment to determine your truth. Expect it. Expect him to bless you. I was not expecting a brand new Lexus. Not when this started. And then I was like, hey, you said you're going to give me a vehicle. I believe you. And I just chose not to worry about it. And boom, shakalaka. <laughs> I'm just telling you, we've seen God rescue time and time and time again. When we had faith and we did not doubt. This will be a, a, a massive year for God supplying our need. And the word supply there, to lavishly supply, doesn't just mean financially. It also means to meet every emotional need. Imagine that. God, I don't feel attractive, so I turn to this, I turn to that. God, I don't feel special, so I turn to this. I Let me meet your need this year. If you, if you have unmet needs, it's not because he's not meeting your needs. It's because you're not aligning with him to meet your need. Let him meet your need. Tell him how you feel. Tell him you don't feel attractive. Tell him you feel stupid. Tell him you feel poor. Whatever you're going through, tell him and allow him in to fix it. Amen? Everyone lift your hands to the Lord. Father, right now in the name of Jesus... Father, we come into corporate alignment, Father, with what you're doing. Father, what you're doing globally, we come into alignment, and I prophesy to the Philippines, and I say, shake, O ground of the Philippines, to the voice of the Lord. Your nation will give birth to revival. The Philippines will give birth to massive amounts of salvations. Evangelism will run rampant through the streets of the Philippines. Drug cartels in the Philippines will become invaded by God's presence. Father God, people will become sobered. God, government officials will start to repent for corruption. Lord, I pray for the gift of repentance to rest on the Philippines, Father. Lord, I pray for stadiums to be filled with souls to be won for Jesus. Father, I thank you that you have a direct plan and that it will take multiple parts of churches moving together. Father, we come into agreement with what you're doing globally, Father, as a church. Father, we welcome and we support our brothers and sisters in other nations. Father, we say breathe, revival, let it be born. Let your Ruach Elohim breathe life in these places, Father. And for America, God, we come into agreement. Father, give us the fear of the Lord. Father, forgive us for our hiddenness. Forgive us for our sins. God, the things that we're afraid to confess, Father, we say forgive us, God. Restore us, God. Give us, God, a new start. Let people feel the freedom to begin again. God, I pray that needs would get met, that people would stop making deals with the devil for pleasure, God, and that we would start looking into your right hand for pleasures evermore. Father, that we would turn away from the seduction of the world. Father, that we would turn away from the hustle of fake church ministry. God, and that we would pursue the authentic, Father, that you want to do so much greater than what we've seen in the fraudulent, God, that it is going to make a public mockery of the fraudulent. God, your real will be so much better than the fraudulent things in the this world. God, I thank you that 2023 is a year of exposing ill motive. God, we come into agreement with the spirit of truth and we say, God, uncover us. Uncover us, God. Any place where we've got skewed motives, God, or where we have lied and not willing to repent, God, we pray for exposure to happen, for people's lives to be made right, God, for your mercy to rain down from heaven. God, let the delete button get hit and people to start over again. Father, we pray for a massive revival. Father, I pray for salvation to spring up from the ground, God, in America. Father, I 
I pray for stadiums to be filled, God, for people to be saved. God, I pray for drug-addicted prodigals to be returned home. God, I pray for those that are secular business people. God, for them to become saved, for them to come into the kingdom, God. Uh, even without their money, God, they are the true treasure, Father. I pray that they would be redeemed in the name of Jesus. Father, help us to move forward, God, with you. Father, we willingly give you any pleasure that surpasses what you want to do, God. Any, any good thing, we surrender at your feet for the purpose of the perfect thing. Father, we come into agreement. Use us. Choose us, God. Father, send us. We will go with our imperfection, with our issues, with our struggles, Father. We will say, send us, Father. And in that process, God, heal us. Even so, Lord, come. Even in our brokenness, even in our imperfection, even so, Lord, come. Father, we pray to partner with your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, amen. Pastor David, would you come stand right here? If I could have a couple of leaders come stand behind David, please. Everybody that's seated, if I could have you extend your hands towards David. <clears throat> David, you are in God's perfect timing. Your role change here at the church is God's perfect timing. You're who he picked. You're who he raised up. No one else. And I saw a really interesting picture of just a broken wineskin. Just the Lord saying, we honor all the things from the past, but he didn't make you to be the same. He made you to be different. And different is what this house needs because that's part of transition into your identity. It's different than your father's identity. And the Lord called you. And he kept calling you a name. When I was up here pacing and praying, the Lord kept calling you a name. He kept calling you a king. He said, he's my king. The Lord said, he's the king that I placed in a place of authority here. And for all those who are listening, who wonder about the transition of what that will look like, I'm here to encourage you. With Psalms 21, Pastor David is the king in Psalms 21 in this scenario, in this story. Proverbs 21.1, it says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. The Lord said over you, David, you've learned already in the face of accusation to do the right thing. You've learned already in the years of sleeping in chairs and pews while your parents worked, you learned to do the right thing. You were brought up just like a shepherd boy on the back hill of this community. And you captured God's attention and the Lord trusts your motive, David. The Lord trusts your motive and the Lord says, wherever I tell his heart to go, he'll go there. The Lord said, David, I trust your motive. The Lord says, your motive has been made pure. Because of the things that you suffered, your motive was made pure. Things that other people would not have made it through, you made it through. And it was for a reason. God didn't bring it to you, but he brought you through it. Because you learned to love. And that's what pastors need to know, is how to love in truth and in spirit. And the Lord says, that's what you've learned to do through this process. You're entering a new season, David. Wow. You're entering the season of Joseph. When Joseph stepped into a new position, his brothers came and they didn't even recognize him because they had never seen him seated in authority. And even those that sold him off came back to him for forgiveness. And Joseph gave them the drink. He gave them the water. He eventually restored forgiveness. 
And the Lord says, as spring first grows, and as you continue to sit at the helm with your coat of many colors, it had made people jealous in the past because they feared what you carried, because they saw that it wasn't controllable. That's why you haven't fit in to the district. It's not something that could be owned. You were your own, and that's frightening to cowards. But the Lord said this, just like Joseph, how his brothers returned to him, the Lord says, there are those who have left this church that are gonna come back to you, and they're gonna repent and they're gonna throw in their flags with you. And the Lord says that there's those that have slandered and hurt you and your family. And the Lord says, and I'm gonna test the true measure of your forgiveness by whether or not you're gonna be able to open your arms and welcome them in. But the Lord said, restoration is coming to this house and it'll be made right in your time. It'll be made right in your time. The Lord says, in this season that I'm going to take you through, you're going to need to be as wise as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. A dove with a big hammer. <laughs> but Lord, I thank you for David's heart. Father, that you said it's like the river, that you'll move it and it'll go that direction. God, that people in this house can rest assured that his heart will flow with your command. Father, that his life and his leadership will be subjected to your flow and your command. God, you said David is a good son, an obedient son. Father, I pray that he would walk out the fullness of his calling. Father, that as restoration knock, knock, knocks on the door of spring, that's interesting. Lord, that there's gonna be a supernatural acceleration, no more delay. Hmm. Lord, I thank you for flipping the switch, turning on the magnet to draw people in. Lord, that it will draw people in. God, that there's a new thing, a new smell in the air, a new taste, a new season. God, I thank you for all the things you're gonna do for his family. Lord, that they'll not be dropped at all. Lord, that they'll grow even stronger as a family unit as they lead, that ministry will not cost them their peace, that it will coincide, that their private lives are matching their public ones. Lord, I thank you for his authenticity. I pray that you'd walk out the fullness of his calling. In your name we pray, amen. My desire for the, everybody that's watching and everybody in this room is that you really take these words seriously. That you don't just leave here and unplug and go, well, that was neat. Luke kind of came and talked about things that might happen in 2023 and things that might take place globally. I, I'm just telling y'all, every year we release prophetic words about what the Lord is showing us. And so far, every year that we've done it, the Holy Spirit's batting 100%. All of it's happened. Everything that we've been prophesying in 2020 about the virus, all this stuff that we talked about has happened. I'm not saying that to build your trust in me. I'm just telling you, the Lord has an excellent track record. Close your eyes. Tell Jesus you love him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for ownership. For everybody in this room, Father, to have ownership of this word. Father, for people in this room to prophesy mysteries, to be obsessed with evangelism, for reaching the lost. Lord, I pray that you would give them no rest when it comes to this topic. God, that they couldn't help themselves that they couldn't help themselves, God, that they'll be spurred on to discuss Jesus and what he's done for them. Lord, I pray for generations of champions to step out from this room. 
We love you, Jesus. Jesus, you are good. You are kind. Father, you are good. You are kind. Holy Spirit, you are good. You are kind. Father, we patiently wait. If there's anything you want to say, Holy Spirit, that's up to you. Lord, we wait. You've done enough, Lord. If you don't speak another prophetic word, this whole night has been full of them. Father, send revival. God, you've already overturned abortion. Father, there's so many great miraculous things you've done, Father. Send revival. Help us, God. Make your church ready. Make our individual lives ready, God. Let us not become self-consumed with our problems, but let us never lose sight of you. Let us return to our first love. In Jesus' name, amen. My job is to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. It's not to make any of you happy. It's to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you what I feel from the Holy Spirit. I feel like we need to wrestle, not literally. I'm just a little guy. I could prophesy over five or eight, 10 people. Be great, take about an hour. Most would already be worried about what they're gonna get, if they're gonna get it, if I'm gonna call them out. And you will already have lost the value of what's been done. And I trust him. I trust his leadership. It's hard for me not to prophesy over people because it's in my DNA to do it. But it's even harder for me to force it when God's saying that's enough. So I love you. And I hope you're not disappointed. And if you are, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. I love you. Thank you for being open and listening. Make room in your life for this word. Do not dismiss it. Go home, wrestle with it. Leave here unresolved. Leave here wanting more and asking him for it. There's things that God wants to tell you and show you that are far beyond what I'm gonna tell you. But I trust him, amen? amen. Pastor? Stand up all across the place. Just lift your hands to the Lord and begin to thank Him for His goodness. Come on, let there be a roar of thankfulness. It's amazing how the Lord just begins to align what he's saying to the church, like globally. Like people that I know that Luke isn't necessarily following or listening to. I 
I heard this week, like prophesying with thunder that the Lord is declaring this 2023 to be the year the Lord says that he is El Shaddai, which means more than enough. It's just the same exact thing. I don't know why I'm always shocked by that, that he's like, speaks the same thing. Like the theme for our, that I hear the Lord saying over our church this year is next level. And Luke comes to me this morning. He goes, the same word that the Lord's speaking to you over, over your church is the same thing that I hear him speaking and what he's been speaking about tonight. I just want to invite you. Like we don't like, I, I know y'all didn't come here to be done like super quick. So like, if you want to seek the Lord, just move in, move into the altars tonight. Find a place to begin to, to begin to seek him. If you want to do it from where you're sitting, you can do it from where you're sitting. But would you just begin to tell the Lord, Lord, we make room for what it is that you want to do this year. What does it mean to make room? That means I have to align myself more with him day by day. Can you just begin to say that to the Lord? Lord, align me with where you want me to be so that I can play my part. So that I can play my part. The worship team is gonna sing a song. I think they're gonna sing, holy is your name, worthy is your name. They're gonna sing. And we're just beginning, gonna begin to pray and thank the Lord. Would you thank him that he's the God that's still pouring fresh oil, fresh water, streams in the desert? Can we align ourselves on the east side of the temple where the water's flowing? Can we move towards that? That's what, the, that's what we're doing tonight. Like in a spiritual sense, can we be saying, Lord, we're moving to where the water's flowing. We see where you're moving. We hear where the prophets are speaking that you're moving and we're moving, we're positioning ourselves. There has to be a repositioning of the church in 2023. There has to be a repositioning of your church in 2020, of, of your family in 2023. Come on, let's, let's be doing that tonight. Lord, I'm moving myself to where your presence is. I'm moving myself to where we see you flowing. Would you just begin to wrestle with that tonight. Lord, what does it mean for me to move to where you're moving? Come on, let's sing.
Come on, begin to thank him that he's taken us to a deeper place in him today. That's the cry of our heart. Thank him today that he leads us deeper into him. Begin to ask him what that means for you and for your family. Lord, what does it mean for us to be deeper with you? Lord, lead us to the deeper place with you. Lord, deeper into your presence. Lord, deeper dependence upon you. Take our, begin to pray for your family. If you're here with your family, heads of households, begin to lay hands on your family. Declare, declare the presence of the Lord. Deeper anointing, deeper passion for him. Lord, take us deeper in worship. Lord, take us deeper into your word, deeper revelation, a deeper knowledge of you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for spiritual eyes that see deeper into the spirit realm. I thank you, Jesus, that your promise is that as far as our eye can see, you'll give it to us. I thank you that there is a zooming in in 2023 for Spring First Church and for our community, a zooming in into the things of the Lord. Lord, I thank you that we're, we're looking deeper into the heart of the Lord to see what it is that you're saying over us. Lord, a deeper revelation, a deeper knowledge of you, Jesus. Come on, just begin, begin to pray that over your life. Lord, take me deeper deeper commitment to him. Come on, begin to tell him, Jesus, I'll, I'll make the deeper commitment. I'll take the deeper steps. Lord, I'll trust you more. Take us into the deep. Into the deep. The Lord's drawing us out of the shallows. Ezekiel 47 was all about getting out of the shallow water. Lord, we'll go deeper with you. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have strategically put this church where you've put it, God. I thank you, Lord, that all roads lead to Spring First Church and lead to your cross, Father. Not for the glory of this church, but for the glory of your name, God. Would you, would you begin to pray for this church that, that people's eyes are drawn to this church as they drive past it? Lord, would you, would you give this church a new signage, Father? 
not a new natural signage, but a new a new spiritual signage, Father, that people's eyes are begin are beginning to open up, that they see this church, that they see a light, that they see a light emanating from this church, Father. Lord, would you let each and every person that comes to this church be a light spreading into this community, Father? spreading into this community, God, that darkness is being driven out, that we're carriers of your light, God, into this community, Father. I thank you that it's not going to be just Spring First Church. It's not going to be just Spring Church. It's going to be Houston, Texas. It's going to be Harris County. It's going to be Montgomery County, God. Ask him to let you be a carrier of his light with greater impact and greater revelation into people's lives that you can carry love, life, hope, wisdom, peace. Lord, would you let me spread your peace into each and every room that I walk into, God? And people say, hey, where do you go to church? Let me tell you where I go to church, but you don't have to go to my church. You can meet him right now. Lord, would you give me an opportunity? Ask him for an opportunity. Ask him for an opportunity to, to share God's love in an uncommon occurrence, in an uncommon instance. Lord, would you, would you let my peace be spread into a meeting that people just, uh, they can't comprehend that this is how the meeting has evolved. That, that they, look at, they look at me in a completely different way, Father, that they understand that this church is a truly authentic house that this church is a temple where your spirit of peace rests over our lives. Ask him for a spirit of peace to rest over your home. Lord, you are Jehovah Shalom. You are my God of peace. I thank you that your peace goes with me everywhere, Father. That your peace goes everywhere with us, God. If we're working in Galveston, if we're working in Conroe, if we're working in Willis, thank you, Father. Thank you that I carry your peace, your love, your life, your wisdom, your hope, that I carry your healing power, Jesus. Give me opportunities, Father. Give me opportunities, God. Pour out your love. Pour out your love in this community, Father. Let Spring First Church be the vessel that's broken, that we throw down our vessels and we shout that we shout and the armies are defeated whenever we break our vessels, whenever we shout out praise that this community is broken, that this community is in disarray and we spread peace throughout it, that your victory goes before us, God. We are your voice. We declare victory in this community, Father. We declare the city is yours, God. We declare that you have given us the city, Father. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Shout for the Lord has given you the city. Shout, the Lord has given you the city. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This house will serve Him. This house will serve Him. My family will serve Him. Your family will serve Him. Your family will serve Him. You are good. He is good. He is good. Just worship Him. Just tell Him how good He is. God, you are good. He is good. He is worthy to be praised. You are the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The great I am. None can compare to you. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy are you, Father. My Jehovah Shalom. My Jehovah Shalom. Worthy are you.
I asked Michael to come and lead us and pray and declare the hand of the Lord over our city for 2023. I want, to, I want you to start expanding your thinking and begin to pray for the global church and ask, begin to ask the Lord to release whatever his agenda is over nations. Kelly, I want you to come lead us. Will you do that? Come, come lead us and pray for the nations. I know that's your heart. I want you to listen, listen. When we pray corporately at our church, this is not a spectator sport. The, the person that, we're, that we hand the mic off to is hearing the voice of the Lord and praying with the agenda of heaven. You should be going in and out of prayer language and then hearing what the Lord is saying to you over agenda, agendas over nations. If you hear a specific nation, begin calling it out. We have to declare in the earth what he needs declared. Amen? The things that she's saying. If you don't know what to pray, listen to what she's praying and then join in and pray along those same things. But let's bombard heaven tonight on behalf of nations in 2023. Well, David, we came here to hear Luke and now you've turned this into a prayer meeting. Yeah, because it turns out that that the Lord needs partnership with the church for us. What the first thing he said is that we can do what he's doing. Well, he didn't prophesy, but over, you know, not many, not many people. No, he released what needs to be said in the earth. And then all of us corporately, if one can put a thousand and two, 10,000, then if we all start declaring what needs to be declared over the earth, we can have significant impact tonight. Well, this is not how I thought it was gonna go. Who cares how you thought it was gonna go? Turns out, it, it, this is how Jesus is wanting it to go. He's here, he's breathing on it. Let's partner with the, what the Lord wants done tonight in the earth. Kelly, let's run after nations from Spring First Church tonight. Father, the nations are yours in the name of Jesus. We just declare that Africa is yours. Lord, we declare that witchcraft will be bound and that the nations will begin to spring up a river out of their belly. And we just declare it, Lord, that that King of King conference that came, that will be fruitful and it will multiply, Father, and that your goodness will spread and that there will be hundreds of thousands of millions of people saved in the name of Jesus and that they will declare that you are Lord. They will declare over the nations. We declare for Africa in the name of Jesus that you are Lord, that you are Lord. We declare it over India that India is yours, that they will no longer, that every temple, that every stronghold will be put down in the name of Jesus, and that India is declared for yours, that that is your land, that we are trampling on your land, and it is yours in the name of Jesus. We declare it over Europe. We declare it over Italy. We declare it over Japan in the name of Jesus. This world, these nations are yours, Father. In the name of Jesus, no more. No more, no more, no more. These nations are for you. We shall declare, we shall declare the goodness of the Lord. The lies that have been told, the minds of the people are gonna be switched in the name of Jesus. The lies for the political fields on these nations will be switched in the name of Jesus. And your goodness is gonna be, there's gonna be healings and there's gonna be miracles, Father. There's gonna be things that the news will not even be able to, to hide or to, to, to show it a different way because it's gonna be from you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And the U.S., the U.S. is gonna begin to spring up just like abortion was trampled, we thought it, we would never see it. But your God is, but your word is true. And in the name of Jesus, we're gonna see more walls torn down in the nation of America, Lord, in the nation of Mexico, in the nation of Canada, Lord. We declare this is your land. Oh, this is your land in the name of Jesus, Father. And the churches are gonna overflow. In the streets, people are gonna be saved, Lord. No, oh, your goodness is gonna flow. It already is flowing. Your goodness is flowing out like a river. <laughs> Just like Luke Holter says, the river's coming up and it starts knee deep and it, and it goes 
close to the waist and it goes over your head. And people are gonna be swimming in your goodness. They're gonna be swimming in your goodness. They're gonna be saved and they're gonna be healed. And they're gonna not even gonna know what's hit them, Lord. But it'll be your power and your goodness. And we declare it for spring first that our mouths are gonna declare your word. In the name of Jesus, we just give you glory. of the primary inter intercessory voices in our church for as long as I've been alive is this wonderful lady, Penny Montgomery. I've asked her to, to lead us in praying for new levels, next levels over this generation, this year, and is specifically over families and our children, marriages, prodigal children, next levels and breakthrough this year. So begin to partner with that. If you don't know what to pray, listen, hear something that she's saying that sticks out and then start praying with her. We're gonna walk. We're gonna walk. God, I just thank you, God, for all of our families, for our children, for the promises that you've given us that they're coming home, that they're coming in, Lord. We call them and we say, come home. We say, come home now, children. I thank you, God, for the mighty work that you're going to do in the homes of, of all the people that are here and all those that are coming in, not just tonight, not just today. Father, that you're going to take care of, you're going to bless, you're going to move by your spirit, Lord, like you promised us that you would do. God, your promises are good. Your word is true, Lord. And God, we just lift up every person that's here and every person that couldn't even come tonight, that their families would come in, that you would do a mighty work, that you would bring healing and deliverance, God, and that those that are out in, in the bars doing drugs and doing alcohol, that they would come home, God, that they would begin to feel the move of the Spirit in their life. And even when they lay in their beds at night, that they would hear, God, your voice, that they would hear the songs of Zion, that they would not be able to get away from what you're going to do, God. And I thank you for a mighty outpouring in this church, that you're going to pour your Spirit out like we've never seen, God. We're going to see things that we've never dreamed we would see, God. We're going to see people walk that are crippled. Well, God, I thank you that you're going to heal people, God. You've been telling me, Penny, I want you to speak healing to my people. And you know I'm going to do it no matter what it looks like because God is moving. And I thank you, Lord, that you're going to heal people with knots and bumps in their body. And you're going to heal people, God, that have all kinds of disabilities. You're going to bring them in, God. Your people are fasting and praying, God. And our prayers are good. God, they avail much, God. They come up before you as a sweet-smelling incense. And God, I've seen you move in this church many times. I've seen you do many things. But God, 
you're about to do something that we can't even understand. It's going to be big. It's going to be bigger than us. And God, I just thank you for it. And I just praise you, God, that you're always at work, God. You're always doing something. And God, I thank you, Jesus, that you are our king. You are our healer. You are our everything. Oh, God, every need that needs to be met, you will meet meet it. And I, God, I pray for those that have broken hearts, that your hearts are broken, that you would bind them up, God, and that you would heal them, Lord, that you would heal mental problems, God, that you would heal physical problems. Oh, God, I thank you, Lord, that you are a great, big, good God, and nothing's too hard for you, God. You are our Heavenly Father. God, you are the Prince of Peace. Oh, God, you speak peace to your children, Lord. I thank you and I praise you for what you're doing, God, in our midst. God, I thank you for blessing our leaders, bless our pastors, every one of them, Lord. Bless their families, God. Help them, God, to excel in what they're doing. God, help them to grow bigger and stronger and more powerful, Lord. Help their voices to be heard all over the neighborhood. Let the people look upon this church. And God, let them see something. Let them be drawn in here, God. Help them to be drawn by your spirit, God. Help them decide, I don't know what it is, but I want to go there. I want to see what they're doing there. And God, I thank you that you will meet them at the door, Lord. I thank you for what you've already done. I thank you that you're a mighty God. And I thank you that you answer all of our prayers, God. You just said we have to ask, and we thank you for it. We thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Before you leave tonight, I want to invite you to join us in doing 21 days of fasting and prayer. We're a week in, and we got 14 days left, and if you haven't started with us, I want to encourage you to fast and pray at least one meal a day for the next 14 days and join in with us. One of the things we did last week, and I want to challenge you to do before you leave this place tonight, Ezekiel Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 8 says, don't let your head lack oil. Say this out loud. I am anointed. You are, the, you are anointed and appointed by the Lord. This is not just a symbol, anointing oil. This is a, a prophetic act that we say, Lord, we recognize that your anointing rests upon us. 1 John chapter 2 says, you have an anointing from the Holy One and it remains. So I want to ask you today before you leave, listen, you've given the Lord all day on Sunday. Participate in this with us as a prophetic act. Lord, I thank you that your anointing rests upon me tonight, this week, upon my family. If you've got children, get them down here and slap some anointing oil on them and and come into an agreement with what the word says over your life that you are anointed. We're gonna sing this song again and we've got anointing oil all across the front here. If you're home, you're watching online, find you some olive oil and don't let your head lack oil in Jesus name. We won't have a formal dismissal. They're gonna sing this song and if you wanna stay, you can stay. If you need to go, you can go. But make your way down here as we sing make sure there's anointing oil on your head.